Hey, this is Jason Canigan from Make Space Boring, the quick show about who I'm meeting and what I'm learning about in the space world. This has been a quick episode, uh, despite it being a full week since the last one. This is episode number 45, can you believe it, uh, for May 16th, 2020. So, got some notes here. Not too many. It doesn't seem like I've been doing as much, but there's been a lot of behind-the-scenes things. Uh, Cold Star Tech became a bronze-level sponsor of the Operational Excellence Society. I recommend you go to opex.org and check that out. There's a huge library of uh, process improvement BPI articles for all kinds of industries and that. Um, there's stuff. There's so much stuff in there, I don't even know what's all in there. I was <laughs> surprised to find a thing about healthcare. Um, like a whole category of articles about healthcare and, and improvement in there, and operational excellence, obviously, uh, given the name. And uh, and it's free, so, you know, go check those articles out. They want me to contribute some. I've got to get my head in gear about, like, what do I actually want to say? That's the second time this week somebody's asked me to write for them, and I do write, but uh, I have to be confident about what I'm saying first, and that it be data-driven and not just my opinion, you know. Um, opinion's great, but facts matter more, um, and then you've got to step back and remember most facts, things that are shoved at you as facts, are actually just someone's opinion. And that is why things are not usually the way you think they are. So, philosophy aside, uh, I recorded two episodes with Chris Stott of the Mansat group of companies uh, late last week and early this week or this week yesterday. Uh, it is a lot of fun talking to Chris. Uh, most of the British guys that I meet are, uh, are happy, <laughs> that's, and that's good. Uh, however, uh, Chris will stop me right there and remind me that he, like me, moved to the United States, and he is a U.S. citizen, despite his accent. Uh, and uh, he's, a, he's a very um, you know, broad thinker about many topics, and we had a lot to talk about regarding space, going all the way back to Jerry Purnell and Larry Niven and... Uh, you know, those guys were just science fiction writers for me, but uh, turns out as I, as I get older, you know, uh, and lose even more hair, that uh, they were active in the uh, sort of the space law, space recommendations field uh, and creating policy with the, the U.S. government about, uh, you know, hey, we don't like this moon treaty and, and other things. So uh, I have much more to learn about that. There's a book uh, called A Step Further Out that uh, just learned about yesterday. Sorry, guys, I feel like such a noob, but uh, <laughs> apparently that's only been around since 1979. So I was on the planet by then, and I could have maybe read it at the age of four or something like that. But uh, <laughs> there's, there's some wonderful uh, economic stuff. I, I uh, just started my um, membership at this website yesterday. It's the uh, International Institute of Space Commerce, another Chris Stott uh, related project, and of course he'll be quick to assure me he is not the only one or the big promoter of this thing, but he's the guy who turned me on to it, so he gets credit. Free membership, uh, you can support at a paid level if you want, but lots of articles there about the economics of space, and that might be where you see an article of mine or two, because those of you who know me know that I do have a strong interest in uh, at least a partial education in economics. I'm the kind of guy who likes to walk down forest paths by myself and listen to Tom Woods talking about libertarian economic policy on a podcast. Uh, so, you know, that, let me just lay the scene for you right there. So I will know what I'm talking about, but I have no real strong opinions just yet. I've got to read some articles on this site here, discover the lay of the land, and then maybe... Um, I will see where I can add value, where I might have a perspective that fills in a gap or something like that. I don't just want to cheerlead, rah, rah, you know, for, for other people, although I do like to do that uh, when, when I believe that the person is on to something really important. Uh, uh, Dr. Marie Baja and the idea of uh, a central um, open source data collection for space situational awareness. There's a thing that I'm rah, rah, go team, go about. I'm not going to build it. <laughs> I love the idea of space traffic management and avoiding conflict. Good ideas, because war is terrifying, and uh, and I know an awful lot about it, so we don't want to go there, right? And anything that helps us avoid that is a good thing, in my opinion, so I will cheerlead. But anyway, Chris Stott, wonderful guy, lots of... Um, Topics are our first episode, and I'll, I'll send these out as a pair. Like, we'll do one Monday and the other one the Thursday, as we're doing two episodes of the Cold Star Project a week now, uh, releasing them. 
Uh, first one was more m mechanical. I wanted to find out about uh, spectrum management, what his, his organization does through the Isle of Man and, and Iceland. They've got offices and different companies uh, with each is uh, allow space uh, craft manufacturers, operators, operators is the right word there, uh, to get the radio spectrum, the frequencies that they need. And uh, <laughs> This is a thing that will stop you. If you don't have this organized and you want to manufacture something, you're not going to get funding because the first question that somebody who has a brain and knows more than I did last week is going to ask you is, hey, do you have your funding or do you have your frequency figured out? Uh, and if you don't have that arranged, and that takes 12 to 18 months really to go through that initial process and you get seven years to use it. Yeah, I learned a thing or two. I can talk about it now, right? Uh, then, uh, then they're not going to fund you because something could swoop in and take that frequency away that you want to use and block you. And all sorts of horrible things could happen. So uh, occasionally Chris's company gets somebody, calls them up and says, oh my gosh, we didn't know we needed this. Uh, and, and there's a dual layer uh, level of, of national, which is who you're going through them to you know, integrate with. And then that international stuff. Uh, where there's regulations upon regulations, and apparently Chris says they're all very nice people, <laughs> so, and I believe him because who would not want you to use this uh, this this limited natural resource, as they like to call it, right? Of frequency, there's only so much room there, and we'll probably get better at dividing it down and using less or whatever. But uh, although you never know, look at what happened with RAM and memory and that in computer games. My old Commodore 64 could run a game just fine, and they would find cool ways to put little bits of code here and there and all that and, and move it around and that and nowadays everything's just 50,000 gigabytes you know and it's going to take you three days to download this thing have fun I don't have much time for that anymore but uh, <laughs> anyway and our second talk was more on the philosophical lines because we had so much to discuss you know he's involved in a number of charities uh, getting folks um, from Israel and India to come over and get um, education at uh, ISU, I think, and and uh, and then go back home and and uh, you know serve their countries with that education, and and that's always a fantastic thing. Again, leading us away from conflict because you understand the guy a little better uh, across the way. I really believe in that stuff. It's it's important. Uh, and, uh, and, and again, talking about uh, the authors of space economics works through the last number of decades. And uh, it was, I took a lot of notes. Um, you know, most of the time, I, those of you who have never uh, been on a show with me, uh, I'll share some of my process with you. I give my guests a Google Doc and I put in, you know, about six questions, gets us to 30 minutes. And uh, some of them fill in really detailed answer notes and others don't touch them at all, but they're glad the questions are there. And that keeps us safe on a compliance or security basis if, if we have that problem uh, issue. It's an issue, Jason, not a problem. Uh, and we, yeah, we, we get past that almost all the time. I think I've only had one guest ever and he knows who he is. Say, no, I don't think I can do this because of the security stuff. Uh, okay, I get it, but we probably could have. Uh, but, but the world that Chris has opened to me about the space economics writing, it, it, once again, it's, it's almost the reverse of the typical problem I see in space where I had thought this was all figured out and then there's nothing, right? <laughs> you know? um, this is a, a case where uh, I didn't even have an idea that this slot was filled with anything and there is a fair amount of work there. So go check out uh, the IISC.IM is the International uh, Institute of Space Commerce website. Again, free. You can't beat free for membership costs, right? If you want to contribute, go ahead at the paid level. But if you're a student, nah, you don't have to, right? Um, there's another organization that's free for students as well that I'll link into the description below because I don't have time to go research it right now. But uh, Cold Star Project episodes released in the last week. These are great episodes. We had David Barnhart, who's the director of the Space Engineering Research Center at the University of Southern California, a uh, former DARPA program manager, uh, him and Gordon Ressler are like this, I guess. And uh, if you listen to those two episodes, Gordon's episode and uh, Dr. Ressler, Jason, uh, and David Barnhart's, you will get a really good picture of what kind of technology we're looking at getting in the near future 
when it comes to robots in space, robotic construction in space. I think it's very, very cool. Also had Daniel Faber from Orbit Fab on, and uh, that was a a dream of a uh, interview from my perspective because. Uh, again, a little bit of my history, uh, I, when I was a teenager, so you can imagine around 1990, I had this sort of vision of myself running an asteroid mining company. Maybe I'll get there, maybe I won't. I don't know. But I made the mistake of telling a few of my uh, contemporaries, and they laughed and said, that's fantasy. And I said, no, that's science fiction. But uh, it made me feel bad enough about the idea that I just threw it away, you know, into the, <laughs> the nether regions of the mine for 20 years or so and then uh, i'm looking around 2014 and there's a couple companies that pop out uh dsi which daniel Faber was ceo of and planetary resources and i did my thing research research you know uh, and i found that the vice president of business development for uh, planetary resources at the time um, i had a way of of reaching out to him uh, that wasn't linkedin you know it was a way that he was probably going to pay attention to because it was unusual and he did, and uh, he gave me a, an hour-long interview, and this was back in 2014, and uh, that was the beginning of my involvement in the space industry, where uh, I was tiptoeing around the edges, and I found out that companies wanted to develop commercialization of space and get off the NASA grant teat and, and create an ec economy of, of their own, rather than uh, waiting around for government to push everything. So uh, that was great, but to talk to, to Dan Faber here, <laughs> that's a six-year open loop there, right, that finally got closed, and that's very cool, and he is super sharp. Uh, when it comes to VC investing and that, he's the guy that I'm going to go talk to <laughs> when it comes to cap sheets and that. Uh, he knows more than anybody else that I've talked to when it comes to space companies and, uh, and VC money. Um, getting the right people, incentivization, covering your ass, all those wonderful things. Um, he's the guy who, who I want in the room on my side. So, uh, you know, and he managed to work in getting an MBA in there and in between DSI and the company that he's running today, Orbit Fab, which is looking at gas stations in space. That simple conceptual idea is the driving force behind a new space economy. What if we didn't have to do the traveling salesman problem of going around servicing satellites or going to destinations in the most efficient manner? Um, and I got to admit, uh, when that idea was first presented to me, I was like, well, why would you? Wait, what? You know, I had this paradigm going on in my head uh, that I had just blindly accepted about, uh, well, we have to do it that way. We have limited fuel resources and we can't refuel. It's not that easy. Uh, the only technology is that Dennis Wingo type, uh, you know, orbital ATK grab on to the ring and push it around with something else methodology. So, and if you haven't, if you don't know what I'm talking about, go go watch the, the Dennis Wingo interview and uh, we'll straighten that out right for you. Uh, so, super exciting. Uh, I think the uh, Chris Dot interviews, that pair, uh, are going to be fantastic for new graduates who are looking for some philosophical perspective on space, like what am I doing here? Where can I fit in? Uh, what opportunities? I mean, I, I had to ask Chris on the second interview about three quarters of the way through, look, you have presented so many options here. And as far as uh, networking goes or, you know, getting started, like where do you start? <laughs> out of the, the smorgasbord of options you've laid out in front of me. I don't know which one to go for first, right? And I'm experienced and, and I'm a good networker. So uh, <laughs> he, he gave an answer. So uh, wait for those. Uh, they should be coming out in three, four weeks, something like that. Um, I, I think they're an amazing pair of discussions and uh, I look forward to sharing them with you. Uh, we have got some fun stuff. I'm going to be rendering uh, Craig Clark's interview, um, another fine UK fellow who I waited a long time to get on. Uh, and I think it's thanks to COVID, really, that uh, some of these folks I've been able to catch up to. Dan Faber and I missed each other about four or five times. We'd uh, try and talk to each other, and, and uh, he'd think I was talking about next week, and I'd mean this week, and man, uh, so to, to actually get to connect with some of these folks can be hard. It's not that they're mean and don't want to, it's just that they're damn busy with, with companies to run, and I get it, I've got my own thing, you know. Um, 
<laughs> I'll do another plug for the OPEX Society. Uh, we'll, we'll link to that in the description below. I'm looking forward to doing uh, more stuff with them. There's, uh, they've got a learning management system uh, with a ton of training content in there for Lean Six Sigma, uh, operational excellence. Uh, and Joseph has, Joseph Paris, who's, who, who runs those things, uh, has a different perspective, a bigger perspective, a higher level perspective on operational excellence than I have seen in 25 years. Okay, that's a big deal for me. When I saw this, I got his book, it's called State of Readiness. Uh, and uh, that means something, that, that term, and it means something different than what I thought it meant at the beginning. Uh, I recommend going and checking that out. It's extremely eye-opening. It, it presents operational excellence as something you can do on the strategic level, which I have never, ever seen anyone else talk about in that manner before, ever. And so that got my attention. I had him on the first Make Space Boring virtual conference. He gave a great presentation. If you haven't seen that, you can go get the recording. The recordings are available for the first and second event bundled together for 20 bucks. I had some kind person who, who attended the second event comment, look, this is like the price of a movie or less than the cost of going to the movies if you're going to buy food or something like that. Uh, and you get all these great lectures. It's like three, four hours each. Um, and it's not, I'm not interested in the thud factor here. It's the quality of the speakers, right? I chose these people because I know these people. They were guests on my show. I invested time with them. I found out who they were and I like them personally. I like the mission that they're on. Okay. Those things are important to me. The values of these individuals. Okay. I get them and I want to help them and support them. And I recommend that you go and learn about them for that incredibly cheap price. Uh, it's like 20 bucks, what is that? You know, I'm not really making any money on it. I have to charge something because it costs money to host these things. If you, I did this as an exercise. For those conferences, little old Jason here made $9 an hour, okay? That's, I could have worked at McDonald's and made more money running those things, okay? I'm used to making $600 an hour, so take a hike <laughs> when it comes to, well, he's only doing this to make money. No, okay? I want to address that because that's a, that's a bit of a sore spot for me. I get that sometimes, you know? For all the wonderful comments you see and everyone going, thanks for putting this together and that kind of thing. And those who understand how much effort it is, uh, there are some folks who have other opinions. So anyway. Isn't it fun to see behind the curtain sometimes? We have, we have some great uh, interviews coming up. Uh, I'm going to start season three of the Cold Star Project. And I know this is long. I'm going to be wrapping up. I've had a lot to share here, though. Um, season three of the Cold Star Project is starting soon. Season two is what you have been watching. You have, uh, and occasionally I'll have a, a season one holdover. Like uh, Walker Dybul. Walker Dybul and I talked and booked um, almost like half a year before he was able to actually talk to me. He's just busy, right? Amazing interview, but that's a season one interview. It's not really space related. It's about buying businesses. But this this podcast purports to be about the unexpected challenges of, of scaling companies, including space firms. And, that. Uh, and so <laughs> that those will be sprinkled in there. But season two is what you've been watching, and that is about space and small satellites, right? Season three of the Cold Star Project, which we'll you'll probably start seeing episodes of those in about six weeks, uh, is with venture capitalists who are funding space companies, okay? So in a sense, I am niching down. Will we not see season two episodes with tech uh, f space folks, of course we will. They'll be sprinkled in there. I, I love meeting people and learning from them. You have no idea what exists in this brain now compared to six months ago right? from, from all these fantastic people I've met and what they've been able to teach me. Okay. Uh, but we will be talking to venture capitalists who fund space companies because I want to know how the money works. Uh, I think that is a key critical thing, uh, particularly with the services that uh, Cold Star Tech is about to offer. I'm just looking at my calendar over here. Um, got a bunch of business stuff coming up at some, uh, some, some VC interviews uh, starting here. It looks like three or four of them over the next couple of weeks. So we'll start seeing that content. And uh, for a while, I mean, before COVID started and I was only releasing one Cold Star Project episode a week, uh, we got up to 26 episodes recorded and in the can uh, as just a buffer, right? So, and I realized I could just sit on my ass for half a year and not do anything and still put out content, right? Uh, 
uh, and great content. And uh, <laughs> that just didn't work for me, you know. The, the poor guests were waiting, right? You know, two, three, four months till, uh, till the thing came out. And some of them are still having to do that. And I feel bad about it, right? Like, if physically, I have a reaction to it. It's not, not a fun thing. Um, so we'll, we'll still be seeing season two episodes come out for some time, but I will be sprinkling in season three uh, episodes with the VCs as we begin doing that. And that's going to be my focus going forward is uh, finding out how space companies get funded and what I can do, uh, what Cold Star can do, because obviously we've got data science and OSINT guys here in that uh, process engineers, marketing, uh, high level marketing folks. To and our space tech, of course, our space people. How <laughs> can I forget? Uh, you know who uh, who can help you get at that money and ensure, like, give you a much better batting average for getting that money. I think that would be super valuable, don't you? So I'm going to stop there. I think I've been talking. I'll bet you it's been 20 minutes here. Uh, and. Uh, Yep, 21 minutes. I'm a good estimator. <laughs> so thanks for putting up with me. This has been um, a pretty interesting and detailed episode, despite the fact that I didn't have 100 people to talk to over the last little while. But we've been doing a lot on the business side. I've learned a lot. And uh, I, I am seeing where Cold Star's focus is going to be in the next 12 months, let's say. And that's really cool because uh, as a business owner, if you're a founder or a business owner, I'm sure you'll agree with me. Sometimes you're just walking through fog going, what, the, what are we going to do next here, right? It's like, great, you created a capability and you were good at this one thing, but the market moves, <laughs> right? And you've got to get out in front of that thing and figure out what new service or product you're going to offer. So, um, mm, there is that offer that I've been putting up, the office hours. I forgot about that. Uh, I mean, again, it's it's okay for me, money-wise, but the impact that I can have talking to a founder who, remember, zero to one is the hard part. Dan Faber said that in, in his interview, and I agree 100%. Going from zero of something to one of something is the hardest thing. Going from one to ten, you've already got the example. It's, it's you know, it's easy when someone shows you how, as they said in... Uh, one of the 1492 movies. So anyway, uh, I'll link to all that stuff below. And um, really, I recommend you go check out the, uh, the Institute, the International Institute of Space Commerce. If you do one thing, if you click on one thing today, I recommend going and checking that out. I look forward to those Chris Dodd interviews. Uh, they're, they're a lot of fun. And I will talk to you sometime next week. <laughs>